to worship this morning. Hymn number 770, Give Thanks. Give Thanks, 770. Oh, 
Radiologist this week, and he doesn't think he needs radiation. So that's been a huge blessing for yeah, this man. week. And he thinks they want to stay on the path of medication that he's been on. And, <coughs> sorry, Grace, I'm not talking. I'm just kind of losing correct here. Sorry, Pastor Greg, if you get up. And anyway, I want to thank every single one of you for your my church family here and the prayers that you've been giving for Dave and hopefully that it won't be a you know a surprise that they say oh we're gonna I gotcha we're gonna change it but um I just want to thank you that you may not need that radiation after all oh. so the announcements women's bible study meets on Tuesday at 1 p.m. in the Adult Sunday School Room, we will be on Lesson 15, A Godly Woman is Elegant, and we will take next week off for um, Thanksgiving week, but um, we'll resume after that. The Men's Fellowship and Prayer meets Wednesdays at 6.30 a.m. in the Adult Sunday School Room. Uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. is the Bible study with David Jeremiah uh, in Philippians titled Count It All Joy. Um, and we'll do the same as you guys. We'll be taking the, that, the Thanksgiving week. Won't, we won't have a meeting. Yeah, you'll break for Thanksgiving, right. for Thanksgiving week and um, study or resume the next following week. Okay, um, today after church is the Thanksgiving potluck, so go in with your appetite and enjoy. Um, Appreciation Night at the Columbia Pregnancy Center, grateful for you, is for everyone in the community as a thank you for all of your support for the center. And this event is Friday, November 17th at 6 p.m. Um, in Rainier. Uh, community meals will be gathering next week. That's our week for um, community meals. And the email that I got, they're having a full-blown Thanksgiving dinner with turkey and mashed potatoes and stuffing and pie and everything. So come and enjoy. Um, even if you don't work, just come and enjoy. So uh, Let's see. Volunteers probably show up at 5 p.m., but the dinner starts, uh, they start serving at 5.30 p.m. And if you can Turn off your media devices, your cell phones, and I gotta do that with mine. Um, turn off the cell phones and other devices so we can fully engage in the worship learning without interruption. So, Brad, sorry I have to do this. One more time, what happens in the fall garden? Prepare the garden for winter. Um, so what we do is most of the time, people at this time, they get ready, they put their beds to rest, they don't do anything, except for those that will dig up those tender perennials and bulbs, um, put, you divide, you transplant, uh, you pull up annuals, but not too soon, because you want some of those seeds to fall and self-seed, or you wait until they die off completely and you collect those seeds for next year. Um, the spent plants and the leaves go into the compost pile. Come spring, we have beautiful what's called black gold that we use to revitalize and nourish the soil for the spring gardens. <clears throat> this time of the year I plant lots of garlic and um, the spring flowering bulbs and those beds that don't 
have anything planted in, I'll put a ground cover so we protect the soil and we also nourish it that way. Um, this year I planted a fall veggie garden, which I've never done before. So anything in the spring can go in. We can do cabbage and carrots and beets and anything like that. And we also prepare for spring. We dream about what our gardens are going to be like next year. We think of the plants and the bulbs and the seeds, supplies that will be needed. We review our successes and our failures. And we may have gotten discouraged when things don't grow, but we never give up. We just never give up. And so where am I going with this? God doesn't want us to become our spiritual life to become dormant or complacent. And he said he wants us to always, always spend time reading, studying, meditating in scriptures. God wants us to plant seeds of faith so we grow and stand firm. And he doesn't want us to give up or be disappointed or discouraged. And all of this he does so he will prepare us for the most bountiful harvest, and that's eternal life in heaven. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter the season of Thanksgiving, may we remember the gifts you have given us, especially the greatest gift of all, your son Jesus. May we also remember every day to give thanks and praise for each and every day is a blessing. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, let's stand as we sing our worship songs. Oh, how I love Jesus. 137 is the first one. <clears throat>
pages back, if you're on the hymnal, 767, we gather together. <clears throat> We gather to gather to Father, thank you and praise you. Thank you that we can count our blessings. How wonderful you are. You meet our needs, and it's exciting to, as you, uh, as you do that, it's exciting to realize that you are God. Thank you and praise you for all that you do. We ask that these tithes and offerings, Lord, would be a blessing to you and your kingdom. And I thank you, Lord, uh, for them. And we just uh, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome and good morning to everybody. I was just kind of trying not to laugh over there because when she was talking about the muting of the phones, my mind went to Bev. I wonder if her phone keckles like a chicken when it sits at the I don't think I'd get through a service if that ever happened. <laughs> well, I hopefully I'll, I'll be quick so you guys don't like uh, smell that food like I've been doing all morning with the little boy I need to get going. <clears throat> Um, last week we started the series, uh, the three-week series, called What Are We Thankful For? And um, the message was the first of three messages, and it was discussing just some of the things that we could be thankful for. And um, last week was based off of Psalm 106. And regardless of how we went through those conflicts, the important Of those conflicts, even though he might be orchestrating us going through them. Um, however, he also wants disobedience not to be present and um, or during the conflict. 
because it could make the situation even worse or even spawn new conflicts. Um, he wants us to be thankful before the storm hits and while the storm is raging and even after the storm is cleared because um, we might also see the reason why God had brought us through the conflict in the first place. And we could be rest assured of one thing. He'll bring us and walk us through the conflict. And we'll focus on the answer of being thankful for the people in our lives, those godly friends and family that we have. Even in these situations, we can find we are thankful that God has placed those people in our lives as well. Um, today, we'll be discussing the scripture in those red Bibles that might be under your chairs. Um, there will also be quick, ref quick references to other scriptures, and regardless, the scriptures will be on the screen too for you. Now, the verses in John 15 are part of a discussion that Jesus was having with his disciples. And uh, this is uh, just after the Lord's Supper had occurred, but just before also uh, Judas had betrayed him. And Jesus is trying to explain to his disciple that he is the true vine. And this is the only vine in which there is a way to salvation. And it's funny that she brought up uh, gardening because it kind of goes into the message. You will love how the Holy Spirit works that way. Every vineyard has a gardener, and any good gardener would do, what a good gardener would do, is care for the vine. And God the Father is the gardener. And the purpose of the entire vineyard is as well. And the garden even has to prune a few of the bad branches. I was loving talking to Gordon this morning of how, again, talking care, taking care of his apple trees, of how sometimes he has to prune some of those branches so it doesn't get so heavy and fall over. Um, but the point of explaining all of this before our text is not just to show what Jesus was doing at the time, but to show that Jesus wasn't doing anything alone. He had the Father to care for him. He had his disciples around him who he, he was caring for and teaching. And nobody was doing anything on their own because Jesus wanted to explain that the relationship between him and disciples was growing. For this, I bet they were thankful for everybody around them, especially God the Father who was orchestrating this whole thing. So let's look at our text today and see how we can be thankful for those around us, especially for each other. So John 15, 12 through 17 reads, this is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his... You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Now when Jesus said this in, in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I loved you, he was reiterating something that he had discussed in a previous chapter of, of John. Um, specifically John chapter 13, he called this particular commandment of loving one another a new commandment. He stated that if the disciples would obey this commandment, people would know that he was, that they were his disciples just by loving one another. And Jesus was not speaking just with one disciple. He was talking to all of them together and collectively. And he, and he expected the disciples would do the same in the future. That was what he wanted to teach them. Jesus never did not include a sisterhood or a brotherhood. Well, I guess there was one individual that wanted to try to do something on his own. That was Judas. Mm -hmm. And look what doing something on his own got him. I guess it might be one of those little pruning things that God was talking about. Um, it is important to note that at the beginning of creation, 
that Adam had a perfect thing going on with God. First of all, he got to walk in a garden. He had the perfect job with him. Um, he, he just got to talk with God all the time if he wanted to. But still, with all of that, God saw that it wasn't good that Adam was alone. He knew that humanity as a community would be part of that sustaining each other in accountability and in love for one another so that the right relationship with God could be maintained. The Greek word for love in this verse is called agapao, and a basic meaning for it is loving someone in a social or moral sense, which is loving somebody like a friend. Um, in fact, verse 13 reiterates that love that the love that Jesus is talking about is a love where there is none greater than to lay one's life down for a friend. Um, it, I, I want to thank all of the veterans to go through um, the battles on our streets and things, you'll find this particular verse, verse 13, to be common amongst them, the, the amount that they'll go to. I'll never forget when my son uh, called me and he was, uh, he had just gotten back from doing a tour of Afghanistan. And he goes, you know, I just, I need to tell you something, I, I re-upped. And I go, well, that's okay. He was afraid I was gonna be upset and he goes, well, I, I just couldn't leave all my brothers to go alone on another tour because they're about to be deployed again. And that's just what that's about. It's about a brotherhood and a sister laying one's life down for a particular reason. So one thing that Jesus is trying to do during this discussion with his disciples is to prepare them, especially for it's about to happen because this was like really the last discussion he was able to have with his disciples before they took him away. And he wanted to explain that he's about to pray, pay the price for humanity's sins on the cross. But he's also trying to decide, draw his disciples in on a closeness. And I always wonder what would happen if he did not have this discussion. Because, of course, we know they scattered when they took him away. And I wonder if this discussion helped kind of at least glue them in some sort of fashion. Because there's also a growth in the relationship that happens when godly people come together. And what Jesus was doing was, yes, for humanity, but it was also for his friends and his disciples. Jesus also had a special meaning for this word friend. It wasn't something that was tossed around like an acquaintance or a co-worker or just that you see people that you see at specific times. It was somebody who had a deep relationship with. And in a way, he was trying to also explain what Abraham was to God, because in the Old Testament, we can see references in, uh, um, in, in how people viewed Abraham as being a friend of God, uh, both Ezra in 2 Chronicles 20 and Isaiah in chapter 41 refer to Abraham as being the friend of God. And if you were to look at the Hebrew meaning of the word friend, you would see that the difference And that's how Abraham was perceived with his relationship with God. And Jesus was trying to explain to his disciples the same affection that is between him and his disciples. So Jesus was trying to stress in verse 14 that if the disciples are truly his friends, they would do as he commanded. But as a friend, they would know that Jesus is commanding out of love, not with an iron fist, that everything that they did is for the glory of God. Now, Jesus further makes the distinction of what a friend is in verse 15. He tells the disciples they're not slaves. Have you ever had a job um, where you knew what your job was, and you have your instructions, but the job is the same thing every day? You don't necessarily know what the main office is thinking. That's just about every job I've worked. <laughs> you might even think there's a disconnect between you and the main office, and there's no communication. You might even think in your past jobs that you yourself felt like a slave. Um, Jesus is making the distinction, though. His friends are not like that. They are not slaves. And uh, if you truly believe in Jesus, then the relationship with him starts from the second you accept him. And, and you give your life to him. And as you grow in that relationship, you get to know him and you know what he wants and know how he loves. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Jesus is also explaining to his disciples here that because he knows the Father, 
everything that the Father has shown him, Jesus is also showing to his disciples. They were not in the dark about anything. Jesus was about to leave them to go to the cross, so he wanted to explain to his disciples that it was important for them to know that this relationship of Jesus being their friend wasn't ending there. But at the same time, they knew everything that Jesus knows because he's teaching them about being their friend all along. Harvey Blaney, he's a commentator in the Wesleyan Bible Commentary, he, he said this, um, the main stress is upon the fact that men are not inanimate objects, but are living, willing, choosing, fallible creatures. Jesus knew this better than anybody else. He had observed people coming and going, now believing, now deceiving, changing like the wind and moving with the crowd. One of his chosen twelve had just decided to renounce his allegiance. What now of the remaining eleven? It was important for Jesus to show his friendship to the disciples. The fact they decided to remain with him showed that they were friends of his. Now in verse 16, we see how Jesus had sovereign authority over his disciples and over anybody else who chose to accept him as Lord and Savior. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. The purpose was so that he could point them to be Christ-like disciples, to go and make more Christ-like disciples. And it's an important thing to note here that none of those disciples, nothing they could have done would have changed the fact that Jesus chose them. It's sort of like when I was playing drums and and then all of a sudden God decided to call me as a pastor. He chose me to do, to, to do that. I surely did not choose to do that. Uh, but here's the thing. I did have to choose to answer the call. When Jesus told the disciples to follow him, they were indeed chosen, but they also had to make the choice to follow him. I can tell you with all sincerity and with honesty that even today, let alone when I first started this journey, for Jesus to be a friend enough to trust in me as a shepherd is an honor within itself. How could I say no when he said when he chooses, chooses me to do something? Because it's a different relationship than a job or being a slave or anything <clears throat> like that. It's a relationship based on love. And we read of how the disciples continue to follow Jesus after, he, after they chose him, after one of them decided not to even. Judas decided to leave when he worked out the plan to get money to betray Jesus. So Jesus, by saying, I choose you, still said it in a way that... Once again, reiterates the command in verse 17. And so Blaney puts it like this. Instead of just to follow my command. It's abide in me. Abide in my love. Keep my commandments. Love one another. That's kind of the way that Jesus had put it. In our modern culture today, this word command seems to have a stark or an abrasive meaning. But Jesus, as he described to his disciples, a friend meant this in a loving and a caring way. So how do we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, loving friends of one another, proceed with what Jesus is talking about here? How do we be thankful for those friends and those people who surround us? Well, when we look at the scriptures in Paul's letters, we get a great example of how he addresses everybody in his letters. It's kind of amazing when you go read this. In Romans 12, 9 through 13, he says, let love, with, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, preserving in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. When Paul writes in verse 9, let love be with, without hypocrisy, he means to let your love be sincere and meaningful and not void of Jesus. He means that the same amount of love that Jesus was telling his disciples in John 15. And in verse 13, Paul, when saying contributing to the needs of the saints, the saints he was referring to here are the people of God, the friends of Jesus. And so Paul, Paul was basically reiterating what Jesus said about laying your life down for a friend. It's about devotion to one another. It's about having 
uh, preference over yourself for another. When we look at a lot of Paul's letters, we'll see the same thankfulness he has for the saints, the people of God, and the friends of Jesus. He always opens his letters with thankfulness. And we can see how he models the support, prayers, and encouragement that Jesus was bestowing on his, on his disciples. Um, a few examples are Ephesians 1, 15 through 16. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. 1 Corinthians 1, 4. I thank my God always concerning for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. Philippians 1, 3 through 4, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all. And in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in my prayers. So coming back to the question, how do we as brothers and sisters in Christ, loving friends of one another, proceed with what Jesus is talking about here? How do we be thankful for those friends and those people who surround us? And the answer is actually action. It's just Meaning we can go over the scriptures, we can read them, we can go into Bible commentaries, I can do everything I'm doing in school, but it does not really click and does not start the learning process for me until I start acting it out. And for me, I really do not get the full understanding of the matter either until I'm actually applying it. And can I say for a second, loving one another as Jesus has commanded it's easy for us Christians who have other brothers and sisters in Christ and we're in harmony with one another, but it's not easy when the friend is not in harmony with us. And it's most especially hard sometimes when Jesus asks us to make new friends, meaning bring people into the church and to bring people to him so they can be saved. To love them as he commands can sometimes be difficult and challenging. And it could be scary and it might not be easy, but Jesus never said it would be. In fact, when you look at Jesus' ministry, you, I wonder how they reacted when uh, the gentleman went to Jesus and talked to him about his child that was demon-possessed. I wonder how scared they were of being around him or being scared of that leper that was sitting over in the corner not wanting to get near him or the adulteress that was in the middle of the, of the ground there that there she was about to be stoned instead of uh, uh, let go and stuff. And so I, I know sometimes that might be a difficult thing to think about, but really that's what we got going on here in our, our community, in our world, is a bunch of people that Jesus wants us to love, and it's scary and hard to deal with them when you don't know how to. You know, I in law enforcement, that those first couple of years scared me. I don't know if I ever said this, but, you know, I, I worked a couple of months and it scared me so much that I took all my gear, put it in a bag, literally a big bag, put it in front of the captain's door and left a note. He called me and talked me into coming back. I don't know if that was a blessing or a curse. <laughs> but when you don't know, I mean, it's like some of the new drugs that are coming out. I was a narcotics investigator. I worked for a, um, a narcotics team in Central Oregon. I knew everything except for a couple of the new things that are out here now. And it's scary when you don't know how to deal with it. Especially if you don't have the power like you could in law enforcement. But even today, law enforcement seems like they get their power taken away. And so it's, it's hard. It's hard to know what to do. And that's where the prayer and the fellowship and the togetherness of God's people come in hand and knowing the scriptures of how to deal with them. Because another thing that Jesus showed is how to help deal with these situations out of love. I mean, he stood right there next to that lady while they're about to stone her and basically said, well, if you're, you know, without a sin, you cast the first stone, none of them could. And basically by her faith, she was let go and she was saved. And how many examples do we see in scriptures about this kind of situation? Whether they're saved or not, Jesus says to love them. And that can be challenging. And part of the reason I gave messages over this last year on being ready on discipleship or accountability or the armor of God 
but so that we'd be ready for the people that might, might come through this door, might be hard to love. And it's, but it's the ministry that Jesus had asked every Christian to do. And even with me, you know, it can be easy to come in here and just sit in that office and get everything prepared and not go out. And now that I'm going out, especially with this job, boy, you're seeing a lot of different, uh, I, I would say, genres and personalities that I see come in and out of that store, not just the people I work with, people I never see. And they're just so different. And some of them have so much hate. Some of them have this joy. Some of them don't know who they are. And uh, so as tired as I am right now, I praise God. He's got me in a position to, to minister to him. Yes. One of the guys I've been ministering this and talking about coming to church because he knows something is missing in his life. And I'm going, well, praise God for that. Mm -hmm. You know, blows my mind. I'll never forget the anxiety of every single job I've started either. You know, the first day or two I started at Walmart, I was going, gosh, you can tell you, I don't know if I could do this. You know, if my body was going to let me. Um, let alone, you know, that was also when I was still doing the school. But it's the fear of the first few days and not knowing anything what to do that is, is when I reached out to Jesus the most. And there is something said, though, about the friends, the brotherhood of, the, of Christ. Those people help disciple you and show you how to walk through and deal with these things. There's something to be said about that, because when you think you can't make it through, you know you have Jesus, but then you have people praying and walking through with you in it. In order to know how to deal with the situation, though, you have to start doing it. And I can tell you, the multitudes of people I'm thankful for walk me through it. Um, and still walking me through, I know what to do in the scariest moments now. And there's probably going to be more scariest moments, even when I know they're going to have an easy time of doing it. And I thought for the rest of the message, I would just give you some examples of my own experience, so you know that I'm not kind of like up here just throwing a bunch of words at you, just to show how thankful I am for those friends and those saints and those brothers and sisters in Christ who helped me walk through my journey. Um, thinking of a, a veteran, uh, <coughs> Pastor Steve Sanchez, he's now in Indiana at Wesleyan Holiness Church, but he was the first pastor I came under in Malala. And I'll still never forget the day, and you guys have heard me talk about the story of walking in the church with the drumsticks the day after getting a DUI and going, man, I don't think I can play here. And he goes, well, just leave it at the altar. You know, take your stuff and leave it at the altar. It was the first inkling I ever got of just surrendering and giving all to God. But what he gave me in that moment was an inkling of what he had to suffer through as an Air Force veteran. When he was flying home in Desert Storm from his tours of duty, he did so next to caskets of his fellow soldiers. And he goes, you know what? I know exactly how you feel, because part of my depression, of course, was law enforcement. And so, you know, dealing with that, that stuff, him opening up and sharing that experience was huge to me because at that particular time, in that moment, he didn't know squat except that I smelled like cigarettes and booze. <laughs> For some people at that church, that's scary. When I show up with that kind of attitude, it is scary. But then, you know, before I even met him, the very first person I met at the church, I think I told you about, about was Pastor Todd. He was a worship director. And I'll never forget meeting him and describing uh, what, the, what the church in the Nazarene is about. But the first thing he told me was, open that Bible and get to know about the truth yourself. He didn't just ram it down my throat. And I'm kind of going, hmm, I got some uh, seeds churning around my mind. But what really hooked me is when I walked in the doors to watch the worship. I wasn't playing yet. He, he wanted to see what, what the worship team was about. And he goes, this is Greg, my friend. Oh, yeah. Friend, yes. you only knew. <laughs> and later on, I ended up, you know, after this incident with Pastor Steve, I met with Pastor Todd the next week and kind of gave him the whole testimony. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when do you want to start playing again? Yeah. What? You know, because they were discipling me. They're walking me through it. Um, and as, as time gone on in my own ministry, I uh, talk about dealing with people you don't know how to deal with. Um, there was a guy I'll just call John Doe. He was a Vietnam veteran who really suffered. 
and he had to be on medicine. Mm -hmm. And he'd come into the church sometimes when he wasn't on his medicine. And we had to sometimes just, you know, go and talk to him and say, hey, you know, you need to be on the medicine because, you know, there are certain things you have to do. Now, sometimes you have to protect the flock, and that's hard. But the door should be, always be open. And so we would always leave the door open for this gentleman. He would show up at other dinners and other ministries I was involved with. And you would see the good side of him, too, And when we get to know people like that. But it was hard. I'll never forget another time where when Pastor Steve had left to go to a different church before he went to Indiana, um, there was a guy that came up and said something about him. And he gave his whole report to me, and I'm going, okay. So what did he say about it when you talked to him? Well, I, 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 so I got to share an experience with Scripture. So as, as you can see, it's a continual circular thing that really works when you have a body of believers uh, holding each other accountable. You know, you all should be thankful for our church board in this room <laughs> that really helps make decisions for the church and, and comes up with ideas and thinks, thinks of things that I don't necessarily think about. It's like we're trying to create a little bit of a budget here, and I've been in a church board, and I just don't know how you create that budget except for, you know, like a little home budget and stuff like that. Um, I'll discuss something here in a minute, too, that will help hopefully help us out, but there's so many different important people that help make the body of that board. Every church has one. Um, this is the part where, you know, I'm going to need those tissues in the back there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I've shared this with some people. <clears throat> See, that's what I get for not sleeping in there. I've shared this with some people, but I don't think I've shared this with the church. And so this is me, like, being really bare here. Um, when I first came here, I knew there was four open Nazarene churches. Um, and I thought for sure God wanted me to go to Sheridan because I thought, well, this would be new if I could do this and I could do that and I could do this. You see the word that's happening here? I'm separating myself out and I said, I. Um, one of the things they do not teach you in law enforcement and a lot of different things, even in pastoral ministry, is how to minister to people who have just lost a loved one. And so, with, so it really, it really scared me. Coming in here after you guys lost Pastor Jim. Uh, thank you. See, that was Robert's job. Thank you. Thank you. So, and, and so, you know, it was, it was hard uh, because I had one way of doing things, and I know you guys had another. And so, us coming together as a body of believers, though, I, I think we're starting on that course. And he taught me how to love um, through those difficult times. And uh, it's funny because I've been, I've been telling our church board my next class is budgets. And, uh, <laughs> and so I was getting excited over that. And then I took a glance at it uh, the other day and I messed up. That's my class after the next one. The next one is pastoral care and counseling. So, but thank you, you know, thank you for your trust in me and and, oh, yeah. and stuff. I'm grateful for every one of you. I mean, that couldn't have been easy. I mean, it was just a few months after. So God put me in the right place at the right time for a reason. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, also think about how the Holy Spirit works in different ways also with people. I'm going... Well, what is the three main things that I've kind of dealt with that were heavy issues in my life? Well, first of all, I'm a musician, and I used to be on law enforcement, and I still deal with some issues. You know, somebody dropped a pallet this morning, and it sounds like a gunshot to me. And I go, ooh. And so I, I still work to deal with those issues. And then, um, you know, I'm a brand-new pastor. So what does God do? 
He puts Dave Novak in this church. A chief of police who's done it. And here he is praising God. He puts Gordon in this church. A pastor who's done it. And can walk me through different things. And he puts Geneva in here to remind me, hey, I can still play. Because <laughs> I love watching these ladies play. And so I really thank you guys. I'm very thankful for all of you. I'm thankful for what we're going to have for a future here. But we're going to do it together. We're not going to do it separated. C.S. Lewis said this once. Christ, who said to the disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, can truly say to the group of every Christian friends, you have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. Um, what I have is... Vicki is going to hand out a questionnaire. Um, the church board has been working on a mission and vision statement. And there's been a couple that have, a couple of the board members who've really put in some good suggestions. And it's just kind of impressed in my heart that maybe this is something we're small enough as a church right now that we can all together come up with a vision statement together and, and a mission statement together. And I'm going to set a goal for maybe the very beginning of the year of maybe having that finalized. But I wanted to pass this out so each one of you has one, and you don't have to do it now. You can think about it, pray about it all throughout the week, and bring it to me next Sunday, or you can email it, or, or however you want to do it. And I'd really appreciate that if you could. And uh, it's got a, got a little bit of a description there. And basically, the mission... A church mission is what we exist to do. What we're basically doing now. What are we wanting to do right now? Focused on the present, basically. It kind of gives you a description of that. And a vision statement is where we're going to go. Where do we need to get to? And the thing is, it doesn't have to be concrete. Once we establish something like that, and have a unified decision instead of, uh, you know, the bigger churches. The board kind of makes those little decisions stuff, but I think we're a family here. That's what's always been pressed on my heart, and uh, I'm hoping to uh, get some involvement from everybody on it. Um, as she's passing that out, I think I'll go to prayer before we get our lyric video going here. Um, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for... Um, everybody being in this room and for the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christ. We're so thankful that even though we've gone through good times and bad times, that you've always been there, that you've brought us together to go through it together, not just to walk alone or not to make a bad decision like Judas did, but to come together like the other 11 disciples and continue on with your ministry. I praise you, Father, so much for this church and what we're doing for our community right now, the uh, community meals and the, um, the, the help with the, the pregnancy center. And we were just talking to somebody this morning, Lord, about uh, the, the wick barrel again for, for donating clothes for the media. There's just so much that we do for our little community here. and That's such a, a big thing. I praise you, Father God, in your name. Amen. 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 Um, I think we sang this recently, but I really wanted to do it because I think it just uh, fit right in. But it's uh, the video, uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Trouble anywhere. <clears throat> 
Messages at Avamir today. So I'll be leaving probably a little after one to go set up for that and and uh, hope my voice holds out. Uh, before I give the benediction, I'll say a quick prayer over the food so you don't have to wait on me. <laughs> um, Lord, thank you for um, today, and I want to praise you for everybody who brought food. And I, I pray a special blessing over it that nourishes our bodies, gives us strength to go out through the day. And we have good fellowship and think about you. I praise you, God, in your name. Amen. Amen. And may we have wisdom to know when to be quiet and listen, courage to be vulnerable and share our story, understanding when we feel hurt, eyes to see ways when we can be a better friend, bravery to share honestly and openly, the capacity to love selfishly and forgive unconditionally, words to share when we are wronged, Ears to hear when we have wronged. Hope as we seek new and meaningful friendships. Grace when it's time for a necessary ending. Patience to restore broken relationships. And may we seek connection, beauty, and goodness instead of gossip. Judgment, comparison, jealousy, or isolation with bravery, compassion, and grace. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed to go in need. Yeah. 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 Yeah.